Well, my name is Mick Pope, and it's my dubious honour to welcome you to the Anthropocene, the age where human beings dominate every aspect of the Earth system. We have now oceans full of plastic, we have an atmosphere that's full of pollutants, including heat-trapping greenhouse gases, and so human beings are literally cutting off the branch on which we sit. More than that, it's the age of stupid, and by that I mean the expertise in climate science and other scientific fields are challenged. We have alternative facts. We have people with an internet connection who think that they know the truth. And so the net result is that humanity is running towards a cliff, blindfolded. So how do Christians live in a way that is faithful in this context? Well, I want to spend a few minutes looking at Romans chapter 8 and what Paul has to say. My first point is that we have to faithfully attest to creation's groaning. Paul writes, For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And Paul's not talking off the top of his head. He's not talking in abstract theological terms. He could see the state of Rome. There's a reason that the Romans built aqueducts into Rome. It's because the Tiber was polluted with human effluent and other things. And the air quality was poor as well. Take, for example, this quote by the philosopher and Roman senator Seneca, who lived about the same time as Paul. He writes the following, No sooner had I left behind the oppressive atmosphere of the city and the reek of smoking cookers, which pour out, along with clouds of ashes, all the poisonous fumes they've accumulated, I noticed the change in my condition at once. In other words, people in the first century weren't dummies. They could see what they were doing to the environment. They could see the impacts of civilization. And so Paul writes what he does. And yet at one and the same time, we read things like what the poet Horace wrote about Caesar Augustus a few years before this. Caesar has brought back fertile crops to the fields. You see, every Caesar had to make the promise that he was going to make Rome great again. But Paul was saying the empire destroys environment. So it's a counter-empire claim that he's making. And so, therefore, in this day and age, Christians can and should recognize and not deny that human beings are damaging the health of the planet. It's not unchristian to recognize the Anthropocene for what it is. Because common grace means that everybody, Christian and non-Christian scientists, can reveal scientific truth to us about the state of the world. In fact, climate denialism is a form of giving false witness, a breaking of the law, which of course Jesus sums up as a love for neighbor and of course for God. So the church should hold up the results of science, and as a direct result, we need to groan with creation. Now that's a difficult calling that requires us to lament, that requires us to suffer, it requires us to go through sadness and existential angst, and I myself have had sleepless nights over this. My second point then is that we need to faithfully repent for creation suffering. The suffering that the creation is undergoing is under human misrule. Our greed, our stupidity, our lack of foresight and our ignorance. How else can we understand both sides of Australian politics getting behind a climate destroying coal mine by promising free water and free money? Where is the sense in that? And yet we're all part of the system which Pope Francis says, the present ecological crisis is one small sign of the ethical, cultural and spiritual crisis of modernity. So as long as we collaborate with the system, we help maintain it. This spiritual crisis means the solution isn't just more good science, although that's important, or more efficient technology, but we'll need that. But it's also changed minds and hearts. In other words, repentance, and that's what the church is all on about, isn't it? preaching a gospel of repentance. So such repentance means changing our ways and challenging the Caesars of our day and their empires, be they political ones or big coal, big oil, big advertising. My third and final point then is that we need to faithfully live for creation's redemption. There is no Christianity without the resurrection. In verse 23 of Romans 8, Paul states that we ourselves groan within ourselves waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. You see, it's a belief in heavenism that leads to escapism and a disconnect with the world around us. This idea of a spiritual, non-physical, detached, after-death existence. 
and it infects so much of the music that we sing on Sundays with insipid lines about our home is in heaven. A lack of resurrection theology, remember, is what marked out the Sadducees who collaborated with the Roman powers and the Pharisees who rebelled against them. The resurrection is a rebellious, it's a challenging doctrine, and it forces us to shake the powers of our day. Paul talks about the resurrection, and not just the redemption of our bodies, of course, but in verse 23 he says that the creation itself will also be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. And this is the application of Exodus language, not just for human beings, but for the whole creation itself. Ultimately, of course, it is God that rescues both humans and non-humans from our human moral failings. But rather than just sit back and do nothing, our hope for the future lays the platform for our actions in the present. So just as we work for holiness in our own personal lives and justice for the persecuted, precisely because we believe in a kingdom coming, so too we should work for justice for creation, easing the burden of its slavery until together we are all set free. Amen to that. <laughs>